culture has to come from the head coach. Right. But one thing I've noticed over the years is that um, success has many fathers. Failure is an orphan. And not, not, many, not many people want to jump in on the failure wagon, but everybody wants to jump in on the success wagon. But as a head, head coach, um, I think uh, role allocation to your staff is just as important as role allocation to your players. Because hmm. uh, failures, failures going to come for everybody. And we want to develop a program here that we're known for overcoming our failures. Welcome to the Jamodi Podcast, where we interview coaches and leaders to find out not just what they do, but how they do what they do. Becoming the best version of ourselves is Jamodi, just a matter of doing it. Today, we are joined by the head men's basketball coach for the University of Houston, Kelvin Sampson. Coach Sampson led the Cougars to the Final Four last season. Over his 40 plus year career, Coach Sampson has collected 667 wins. He has led four different schools to the NCAA tournament and was named the AP Coach of the Year in 1995. Before we hear from Coach Sampson, take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media at Jamodi Podcast. What are you saying, Matt Saman? What's up, Coach? How you doing, man? You have man. Aged, uh, you've aged well. <laughs> I would say the I still, same for you. I, still remember, I remember that blonde, blonde-headed kid out there, tough, uh, smart. <laughs> Uh, team guy, make threes, guard you. I remember that guy, Coach. When I when I when I reached out to you on Twitter, I thought there is no way that this guy can put it together. This coach can put it together from a, a dude that averaged four and a half points a game, you know, for three years. But man, your your memory <laughs> that's impressive. Yeah, uh, uh, who was on your team? Well, uh, you know, uh, John Lucas and Lawrence Roberts were sophomores my junior year um and we were kind of up and coming and yeah you know knocking on the door a little bit our, like our record didn't really reflect how competitive and how good we were mm -hmm. but uh and then then the next year everything changed so yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I remember i was um i was playing golf this this would have been august september maybe and I got a call from John Lucas's dad uh, asking me would, would I take his son at Oklahoma. And, um, um, but, you know, we, we already had pretty good guards. Yeah, you did. And, I, yeah. and we recruited uh, Okafer hmm. from uh, Bel Air High School. And Lucas was on that team. And when I signed Hollis Price, Hollis was six foot and 142 pounds. And honest to God, I think Lucas was smaller than him. He was. Yep, he was. He was uh, He was tiny. But you could tell he was going to be good. But he was only a sophomore the last time I saw him. And he kind of, uh, when he first got to Baylor, I, you could tell he was going to be a good player. But we already had good guards. At yeah. We just didn't take him. It's Probably amazing. It, well, it's amazing too how I think system has a big thing to do with it. It when his skill set didn't fit the system that Coach Bliss really wanted to to do. He wanted to run it through Lawrence and which mm -hmm. is pretty smart because Roberts was pretty good, but but then he went to Oklahoma State and it was all through him with pick and rolls and things. And he had a monster junior year while while we were uh you know sitting there just trying to put a team together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he did. Wasn't he a big twelve player of the year? Yep. Yeah, that's right. Year? Maybe a senior year uh, they finished up that way, and they made a pretty deep run too. And yeah. but then, I mean, golly, played in the league for a little while and ten yeah. years. Yeah, it's incredible. Ten yeah. year, ten Holl year. Hollis Price was one of my favorite guys to compete against, uh, and your teams. I mean, I just always loved how hard your teams played, and yeah, yeah. But he was special, and especially like you said, small, but man, what a competitor. He's right. He's in his office right around. Oh, the nice. I, I may have to reach out to him too because, yeah. yeah, I'm trying to reach out to all the people that, man, just had an impact on me in some way. And uh, you're definitely one of those guys. I mean, the kind things that you said to me all those years ago, uh, but, you know, but also just the respect I had for you and how your teams played. You know, your, your teams have always played just so hard over the years when I, I've been able to watch. Well, how does culture drive the performance of your teams? Well, I've always believed this. If, 
if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there. So you have to know where you're going. And, and for me at Montana Tech, uh, the best teams in our league were the College of Great Falls, who had an outstanding coach and Steve Eggers. Um, Mark Adams, the ESPN guy, was the head coach at Rocky Mountain College. He had good players. He had a kid drafted. Uh, uh, Great Falls had a kid drafted uh, from that league. Uh, and we, we, you know, Montana Tech was an engineering college. So um, every degree curriculum required a minimum of 30 credits of math. Um, so we weren't getting the same players they were getting. We started getting better players, but we had to come up with something to hang your hat on. But what is it, what is it we're going to hang our hat on? You know, my dad made the Hall of Fame not because he won state championships. The year he got inducted in the Hall of Fame, David Thompson's high school coach uh, from Shelby Crest High School in North Carolina and uh, Dominique Wilkins' high school coach from Little Washington High School went in. Well, they won state championships. They, they had, you know, David Thompson and Dominique Wilkins, uh, North Carolina's littered with Hall of Famers. James Worthy, Sleepy Floyd, Phil Ford, Pete Maravich. I mean, you go on and on with that mm -hmm. state. But um, he, he had to do more with less. You know, uh, you're looking at one of his best players. Uh, that, uh, it, that tells you he better figure out how to do <laughs> way more with less. Um, but he did. You know, he, he played a 2-1-2 two, two zone. Um, he's the first one I saw that would, would tempo press the 2-1-2 two, two zone, slow everything down, difficult to score on his teams. Hmm. Um, you know, he, he, he ran, he called it passing game. And it was kind of structured, but, you know, it was um, a lot of shuffle cuts, ball reversal, do it again, uh, shuffle cut, pin down, ball reversal, do it, you know, and then the longer the possession would go, boom, you go get a layup. That's the way he coached. So um, he, had, he had a plan on defense. He had a plan on offense, and everybody bought into it. Um, and, and those kids back then – uh, we were a real small, rural, poor community. So we knew each other, um, grew up with each other. We all played basketball, baseball, and football. We, we all played three sports. Some, mm. of, some, of, some of us played four, uh, ran track. Um, so from Little League Baseball all the way through high school. Um, but, you know, you, in, in college, in college, you, you recruit these uh, – quote, star guys, you know, really good players that's been, been talked about forever. Um, and I think the most difficult thing, uh, and this is what the great programs do, is they get kids to play for each other. You know, mm -hmm. everybody talks about things like that, but it, it's difficult to do. That, that's why I always tell people, you've got to know where you're going. In Montana mm -hmm. Tech, I found out where I was going based on what the other schools had. I, I couldn't play like them. Yeah. Um, so we, we had to develop a, an edge. And, I, and I've always been able to put a chip on my kids' shoulders. I take my chip and put it on them because I've always had a chip. I think coming from where I came from, you know, people from where I came from, <clears throat> most of them knew exactly what they were going to do with their lives. They, they, most of them would finish high school, go to the local college, uh, get a teaching certificate, um, and then teach school for 30 years and retire. Yeah. That's it. That's what, and the ones that didn't went to, uh, went to the army, uh, went to Fort Bragg, uh, 82nd airborne, which is 30 miles from where I lived. Um, everybody went to the service or a school teacher. That's it. My, my dad was a school teacher. My mom was a nurse. I didn't know anybody that lived out of state. Hmm. And so, um, so I, I, that I came from that to coaching and, um, but, but that's never left me. I think, yeah. you know, we always tell kids to don't ever forget where you came from because that's, that's, those are the experiences that shape you. The kids that change, you know, people that change and, and try to let the great experiences shape you, you know, you have a tendency to forget. I, I've never forgotten, you know, the, the chip, the chip we had, uh, or I had to have on my shoulder at Montana Tech. So we decided that we're going to, um, 
loose ball drills, take charge drills, toughness. I didn't even care. You know, I had a philosophy back then, uh, Matt. I didn't care how many guys fouled out. You know, I said, if we foul every possession, they can't call them all. Let's go. You know? Yeah. <laughs> just, just be physical and, and uh, you know, beat the crap out of people. But yeah. they, they're going to know, they're going to know uh, when they play Montana Tech, that's going to be the hardest nose, blue collar, toughest team in our conference. And that's how we won. You know, we, we didn't match up talent wise. Um, and, you know, I, I knew who the best teams were. The best teams had the best coaches, you know, uh, and I learned from them. There was an old guy at uh, Western Montana that was way ahead of his time. His name was Casey Kelts. Casey Kelts, his best friend was Dick Mata. Mm. Dick at the time was the coach of the Mavericks. And um, um, he invited me up to speak at his basketball camp, you know, when I was head coach at Tech, when I went to Tech, I was 24. I was 25, turned 25 in October. So um, these guys were all mid-40s to mid-50s, been at their schools forever, were legends in their community. And here's this kid from North Carolina by way of Michigan State. Who is he? <laughs> I was asking the same thing. You know, who am I? Um, but, you know, I, I developed that mentality uh, Montana Tech forced me to come up with a way if I wanted to win. If you're going to win, you better figure out how to do it. Yeah. Uh, but I, but one thing I tried to focus on, Matt, was not repeat mistakes. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I wasn't a very good end of the game coach back then. I made mis but I wrote them down. You know, um, substitutions, fouling, um, uh, taking advantage of matchups. Uh, shot selection you know I was I was into all that stuff back then and then uh, when I went to Washington State there's 10 teams in the Pac-10 you know the toughest job was Washington State so here we go again <laughs> how, how are you going to win at Washington State Oregon State had Gary Payton Arizona had Sean Elliott Terrell Brandon was at Oregon wow Stanford had Todd Lichty and Adam Keefe Cal had um uh, multiple pro. Everybody had pros. Eldridge Kasner was at um, Washington. And here comes Little Washington State. Um, my third year, we went seven and twenty-two. We lost eighteen straight games. Um, I think that that year, um, I learned more about me that year than than any other year. Hmm. Um, I was proud of that team. A team was seven, seven and twenty-two. You're, but you were still proud of the work that they had done that year. Yeah, uh, they yeah. never quit. You know, we we weren't as good as those teams, but I, but I would I would tell our I would tell our kids every game. You know, you know, we we we'd lose the game, get to the next one, lose the game, get to the. We just kept losing, 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 losing. But th this story will tell you uh, how how um, and I still stay in touch with almost every one of the kids on that. Um, well, That's I'm awesome. Talking to Daryl Woods the other day, Winston Bell, Benny Benny Seltzer. I mean, we we had some uh, great kids on that team. So that year, the Pac-10 tournament was in uh, Tempe at Arizona State's gym, and um, we're playing USC, and they got uh, Harold Miner and a bunch of freak athletes. And here come the Cougars. You know, people don't <laughs> take it serious. We get up twenty-two to five, and. Um, you know, in the back of your mind, you know, um, how in the world we have 22 and five? <laughs> with those guys? But they didn't take us serious, but we did. Yeah. You know, our, our kids, even though we had been beat up, we've been bloodied, that we weren't knocked out. We, we were still fighting. We're still trying to get to the, it's a 15 round fight, right? Yeah. Well, you don't, you know, if you're losing, you, you just keep fighting, you knock you down, get back up. I mean, those are lessons you learn. And it's a great they, foundation to build a program on. As it well. is. Yeah. It really is, Matt. And uh, we wound up losing that game, which was our – we were 1-0 in the Pac-10 that year. And then we lost 17 straight. Our, our two best players, David Sanders um, and Todd Anderson. Todd was a seven-foot kid from Sammamish, Washington, and David was a 6'2 guard from Spokane. Todd averaged 13-7 and seven the year before, and David averaged about 14 he, he, he was a little bit ahead of his time. Um, he was Mark Price from Georgia Tech. Hmm. Really good shooter. But it's weird. I lost them all. I lost both of them early December. 
and um it's hard to overcome time, that sometimes. yeah and at the time we lost we'd been out to knoxville tennessee uh alan houston uh was playing for tennessee at the wow time. amazing players man yeah yeah and and we almost beat them we beat uh uh it was an 18 we beat two teams and we lost to tennessee mm-hmm. and i said we're you know we were probably a uh uh, eight and ten, uh, maybe nine and eleven, if things went well, um, uh, conference team. But when we lost those two kids, my best players became freshmen and first year JUCO kids, mm. and that's um, that's a tough recipe. But that's the way it yeah. is. You, know, you yeah. don't, you don't. But that that team fought all the way to the end. Yeah, uh, twenty two to five. I think we lost maybe by eight or nine. They they woke up and realized we were we weren't going to roll over, but uh, that, that year, and I tell people about that, you know, there's a, a, there's a ladder over here in the corner. Let me see if I can. Oh yeah. Yeah. See that ladder. Yeah. Joe Castiglione sent me that ladder and uh, the, the ladder says, I hope you'll need to use this a lot during your journey as a Houston Cougar. Well, we, we've, we've cut um, two nets down here from winning championships yeah, and I and I tell our kids all the time. I take this ladder to their first practice, and I set it up, and I said, "You guys, we're going to get the wrong idea about why I set this ladder up." I said, "I want you to look at the first step." I said, "The first step on that ladder um, is your first step on the ladder to success." <clears throat> I said, "Your first step is going to be failure for every mm-hmm. one of you. It's going to be a a a." Or a Practice where you got your butt blistered, where you had to run, run forever. Uh, you're not playing hard enough. You're not rebounding hard enough. Uh, you're not uh, getting on the floor hard enough. Um, and those are going to be failures for you. Um, if you go to class, you be a good person, um, make good decisions off the court, your life will go fine. But on, on this court here, it's a different life. These are the things you have to do. But I said, those of you that that choose not to, that first step will be failure. Hmm. Now, after that, key is to get to the next step. And then once you once you take the necessary steps, don't skip steps. Every step represents a different stage in the season. Love that. And um, and so I take the ladder, put it back in my office. It's always here for our coaches to see. But you know that there's a there's a symbol there's a symbol to growth. You know, failure is a lot of things. It's falling down, getting beat up. But, you know, you really never lost anything until you quit. As long as you don't quit, you know, you'll, you can fail. Failure represents, you fail in a lot of different ways. Uh, life, life, will, life will throw you some fastballs that will hit you. But you um, can't quit. You can't let other people define who you are. You have to know who you are. And I think that's how you develop your culture. You, you know, the culture has to come from the head coach. Right. But one thing I've noticed over the years is that um, success has many fathers. Failure is an orphan. And not, not, many, not many people want to jump in on the failure wagon, but everybody wants to jump in on the success wagon. But as a head, head coach, um, I think uh, role allocation to your staff is just as important as role allocation to your players. Because hmm. uh, failures, failures are going to come for everybody. And we want to develop a program here that we're known for overcoming our failures. Um, success, that's a byproduct of um, a lot of things. But if we can not forget those little things, you know, I've always made a big deal out of, uh, always made a big deal out of, uh, little things. And I think that's why um, our teams over the years, whether they be at Washington, Montana Tech, Washington State, uh, Oklahoma, uh, I wasn't in Indiana uh, long enough, um, and then here at Houston. So it's been, it's been a uh, wonderful journey, um, Matt, but those formative days at uh, um, Montana Tech, so appreciative of that opportunity to fail. And I did, but but I learned from it. Coaches, the Jamoti Podcast is powered by Biology. 
What's your BSA score? The Bology Skill Assessment is the only verified skills metric endorsed by the NIA and NJCAA to discover and develop the best talent for your team. This 10 minute, 100 shot test can be taken for free today on the Bology mobile app. Elevate your game. Coach, it's so cool to get to listen to your, your story and kind of, because I've been uh, such a fan of yours for for a long time and competing against you and now watching you and just to see the dots kind of connect on that map and how, you know, we so many people want to have teams that play as hard as yours and have a chip on their shoulders like yours, but it started with you, how you were as a high school player, the, the town that you grew up in and then the jobs that you started in and and the fact that I love the fact that with that ladder, you know, my immediate thought was when you showed it that you go up and you practice cutting the neck because that's what we're going to do here. But you actually start at the bottom and you talk about yeah. you're going to fail quite a bit. But the biggest thing is don't quit. I think that's that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't. Um, you know, this year we cut two nets down one one. Uh, our conference tournament championship against Cincinnati and then uh, beating Oregon State in the Midwest Regional. And I keep, and they gave me sis, they gave me a set, uh, pair of scissors when we did the Oregon uh, State thing. And, uh, you know, like everybody else, you get a piece of the net, or I, I think I got the net here somewhere. Um, but, you know, we never talk about the destination. Mm. You know, I, I, I focus on the trials and tribulations of journeys, it's a journey. And at the end of the day, that's what you remember. You know, it's like Scott at Baylor. I was at Oklahoma when he started. I, I remember, I think, I don't remember it was three or four years. But I remember his first year, second year, third year, um, if it was fourth year. I, I remember what it was like. So when we played them uh, that Saturday, um, there was a different appreciation for me mm. playing Baylor than maybe other people. Um, I, I, I thought about, you know, the Montana Tech, um, yeah. Yeah. the 22, um, 18 consecutive losses at Washington State. But Scott had gone through that too. You know, he, he knew. No, no, nobody. Everybody talks about the rebuilding job we did here. It doesn't compare to what he did at Baylor. Yes, sir. It just doesn't, you know, unless, unless you were there. Yeah. Uh, You'll yeah, never we, fully understand it, but as an opposing coach, I remember. I remember um, at the end of uh, Dave's years, he he had pretty good players. Baylor was kind of on the way; they right. were going to be good, right? And then whatever happened happened, and then Scott comes in, and you know, it's, it's the toughest thing for him uh, from an opposing coach's standpoint. And I know nothing about the inside is that our league was so good. Yes, sir. It was. <laughs> you know, that there's you know, Texas and Oklahoma State and uh, Tech, Kansas, uh, Missouri, Nebraska. There was nobody to beat. Yep. If you didn't have a good team, you're going to get beat every night. It's kind of like my teams at Washington State. We, we, we couldn't beat anybody. We tried hard, but we just weren't good enough. And that's what that Baylor team was like. And then, uh, but, you know, break by break, man. Yeah. That's, that's how this thing works. You, you do it brick, brick by brick. If you do it brick by brick, uh, Matt, um, it stays. Teams, coaches that want to take shortcuts and build in their rosters, Yeah, you know, their, their houses usually are built in sand. It but catches up it, to them. Yeah, if you do it the right way. Sustained success means that you build a program. Mm -hmm. You know, one hit wonders means you just had a good year. So, yeah. um Scott has built a great program, and, and that program's been built on uh, uh, his culture. Yep. You know, culture, culture is a, a, a word that's a synonym. It it's, it's, um, sounds the same to everybody, but has different meanings. Yes, sir. You know, Scott, I don't know how Scott built his culture. You know, like most people don't know how we built our culture here, or how Mike has built his at Duke or Tom at Michigan State. But those, uh, the programs that, Year after year, you, you know, they're going to be good. Um, um, have, have gotten kids to buy in, and, and the head coach knows exactly which road he wants to go to. You know, if you don't yeah. know which if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there. Yeah. And those coaches that know, know exactly what road to take.
my senior year uh, at Baylor was Coach Drew's first year. And we had six scholarship players. And like you said, to play against teams like yours, uh, Rick Barnes at Texas and all those. And, and it was difficult, but I really resonated with your team of seven and 22 because we were eight and 21. And it was the most successful team I've ever played on. Mm -hmm. uh, just because we showed up and we played hard and we didn't quit when most people wouldn't have, uh, have uh, blamed us for quitting. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciate you sharing that story. Uh, it, I think it'll resonate with a lot of people out there. Yeah, the um, our first year here, we went 13 and 19. I've been married to my wife for 41 years, I think 42 in June. And she's never asked me um, to have... You know, she's just a great coach's wife. You know, she's just been she's been every step of the journey. She deserves as much success, success about this stuff, uh, credit for success as uh, anybody. Uh, but she asked me would I get a ball signed uh, by that team. Because at the end of the year, our starting four men, our starting three to start the year was our point guard. Um, we had, um, you know, when I took this over, you know, we're in an age where kids just transfer, right? Right. All the best players transferred. And, um, you know, we, there was no transfer portal then. If there had been a transfer portal, we wouldn't have went 13 and 19 probably. But, you know, we just we just picked the pieces up and said, we're going to build a culture that's going to start this year. Here's why we're going to do it. If we lose games along the way, then so be it. I don't care. Um, but sometimes young coaches are afraid to lose, mm. uh, whereas veteran coaches aren't. I'm, I'm not afraid to lose a game. If, if it means that um, it comes down to, you know, pushing our culture through. But uh, that team that team won its last four games, and then we lost to Tulsa in the conference tournament, and they were an NCAA tournament team that year. But they never quit. A lot like that Washington State team. Those two teams were great kids. One of the kids that impressed me so much, I inherited him. Uh, I hired him as part of our staff. Wow. As I said, you, your your character and maturity, leadership this year should be rewarded. Uh, so I, I yeah. hired him as a grad assistant. I moved him up. Now he's a full time assistant at Lamar. But, thank you, uh, yeah. Thank you for for remembering those players and remembering yeah. those teams and guys like you and guys like Coach Drew. I think that's why you're you're successful everywhere you go and you've been able to build these strong programs. Is because you don't forget. Yeah. Uh, the foundation pieces. I really appreciate that about you. Well, I appreciate you saying that. What's the one thing you would do differently if you could start over in coaching? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> what would I do uh, differently? Um, I don't think anything, Matt, because yeah. I think it's important to fail. Yeah. I, 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 I you shouldn't everything that happens to you are experiences you learn you learn from your failures and you learn from your successes you know we're, we're all human beings which means that um um you know I, I really i really believe that that coaches have to take seriously um their role as being mentors uh, for these kids. And over the years, I've taken chances on uh, kids um, that some people wouldn't, but I can look back and say that almost every one of those kids graduated. Hmm. They've gone on to live good lives, and, and, and I've been chastised for that, um, you know, get in line with that stuff, I guess. But um, I, I, I just I just think that you're, you're going to make failure, have – don't don't try to eliminate your failures. Learn from them. It's okay to fail. You know, don't be afraid of it. We hear that, yeah. but it's really true. You know, it's um, it's is how you is how you react to it. You know, um, like this this team this year. You know, we our best big man was Fabian White. He tore his ACL in May, and we didn't get him back until the middle of February. You know, our preseason player of the year, Caleb Mills decided uh, he was going to leave um, um, uh, around Christmas time. I can't remember the date now. And then uh, Nate Hinton, who I thought was going to be a first-team all-conference player for us this year, put his name in the draft. 
and signed a two-way deal with Dallas. Um, and then we had, then we, then our best big man last year was Chris Harris. Uh, he was a senior and graduated. So basically this team lost four starters and, um, um, our kids didn't bat an eye, you know, that was, that was adversity, maybe not failure, but adversity. Um, we developed a, a resolve. We, we developed confidence, um, and you, you know, coaches, it's, it's my job to give them confidence. Then it's, then that's recipro- that has to be reciprocal. Then they have to give me confidence. Mm. Um, and this team was good at that. You know, teams that underachieve, Matt, usually have poor player leadership. Uh. Teams that succeed at a high level usually have player-led teams. This was very much a player-led team. Our, our players led this team. Dejan Giroux was a tremendous uh, leader, and what a story he's had. Uh, you would have thought – I would have probably been the last coach that people thought he would play for. But, but he, um, he surrendered, put ten, ten toes in, and, and, and took off. But uh, this team had a wonderful journey. Um, we played one team in the seven years I've been here that um, – was just significantly better than us, and that was Baylor. Mm. Um, and I thought that was the only team in the country that was this year. Um, I thought we could play with anybody, yeah. um, but that that team was that team was like Gary. There's three. I played against, coached against three players in my career that could dominate the game at both ends. Uh, Gary Payton when he was at Oregon State, Jason Kidd when he was at Cal, wow. and Davion Mitchell from Baylor. Wow. Um, I've had a lot, seen a lot that were great at this end, but that end, not very good. Th- yeah. Those three guys are elite. Peyton and Kidd uh, offensively were monsters in college. So is Davion Mitchell. Yeah. Then you turn around to defense. He just, <laughs> it's like Deion Sanders. Chest bumping you. Chest yeah. bumping you. Oh, yeah, he's, I, I loved him. I, I, yeah. I told Scott. You know, Scott and I became good, have become good friends. Um, mm. But I told Scott that, you know, um, I don't know if you'll ever have a team like this, but in, in, enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, That's good advice. Yeah. yeah. Enjoy, enjoy this team. You, the teams like this just don't come along uh, very often. Sometimes when you see somebody every day, like the Baylor fans or the Baylor media, uh, you, you have a tendency not to understand how great they are. Yeah. But this, this team in 2020, 21, was um, uh, by far the best uh, men's division one basketball team in America. Wow. And it wasn't close. Wow. The Jamoti podcast is powered by Sideline Interactive. Sideline Interactive is the leading manufacturer for high quality, innovative scoring tables and LED video display boards that help coaches and schools bring more excitement to fans, create huge fundraising opportunities, and make their jobs easier. Visit sidelineinteractive.com to check out their amazing products. You mentioned something a second ago about giving players confidence. And can you, and I love the idea of them reciprocating that, you know, back to you. Can you go into a little bit about what are some ways that you do instill confidence in your players? Well, confidence comes from preparation. Mm. You know, um, you know, I have a thing written on my board. I tell my, um, my I have a big whiteboard over here and I'm constantly writing ideas down. And so I love to come up here on Sundays because uh, I know I'll be here by myself and I can, uh, I've got a big monitor there. I'll, I'll pick a game that I want to go watch. Um, um, I have everybody, uh, my video people have these things edited down to the minute where there's no stoppage in play. I don't right. know. I don't listen to what the announcers say. I just watch the film. And then I just start getting ideas and I start writing them down. But uh, one of the things that we believe in here is player development. Mm. If you're not going to recruit five stars, then you better develop five stars. Love that. Love that. Um, and we, we're not a recruiting program. You know, we have to, we have to get kids like um, Marcus Sasser, who nobody wanted out of high school, you know, um, Fabian White from Atascacita High School. You know, we get kids that aren't, you know, people don't know quite a lot about. 
I don't think I've ever had a top 25 recruiting class in 32 years of being a head coach. Hmm. But we, we do a good job here development because of one thing. I tell our assistant coaches, we have to be the gym rats. You know, kids aren't gym rats like they were before, but there's a reason for that. You know, there's so many built-in distractions they have. I think the, the social media thing, the phone thing, I have to adjust to all that stuff. You know, you just, yeah. You know, I used to have rules, don't bring your phone here. But those kids can't live without the phone. <laughs> That's right. You know? That's and, right. So I just, I just gave up the fight on that. And I just said, you know what? That's part of evolving as a coach. You know, in coaching, you better learn to coach one eye open and one ear closed. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You start trying to see everything and hear everything. You're, you're going to wind up doing everything but what you signed up for, and that's to coach your team. Wow. Um, but I think the, the more we get our kids in the gym, um, I've got – my assistants are great coaches. They are. Kellen is going to be a great head coach. Qantas White is going to be a great head coach. Alvin Brooks was my third uh, assistant. He just left to take a Lamar job, and I moved a, my video coordinator up to his position. Hmm. The reason I moved my video coordinator up is um, I'm, I'm a little bit leery about hiring, you know, guys that are great recruiters. I don't want a great recruiter. I want a great person. I want a great guy that wants to develop these kids. You know, we're not going to out-recruit anybody. So why am I trying to do that? Yeah. You know, I don't all of a sudden want to start – uh, a bunch of five stars. Not that I wouldn't take some, <laughs> right. but that's not who we are. You know, it's just not what our. And you have to be true to who you are. You know, Quentin Grimes was a five star. Um, had a very average to below average year his junior year. Got a lot better as the season progressed. But uh, um, but Quantus White hadn't the impact Quantus had on him cannot be understated. Hmm. You know, his confidence came from his preparation, from his work. Uh, that's where you get your confidence. Me telling you, that's okay, son, uh, keep shooting. Um, that's not giving you confidence. That's that's just throwing false hope out there. Right. Uh, your, your confidence comes from sweat equity. Hmm. You know, and, and, and if you don't have sweat equity, then you don't deserve to succeed. There's, there's a difference in owning something versus renting something. A good night, one out of 10 nights, it means you rent, you rented your sweat equity. When you have 10 great nights, and I'm not talking about uh, where you score 20 points a night, where you impacted winning 10 straight nights. That's why sweat equity comes down to it. You know, we, we have different charts that we track, like offensive rebounding. When the ball is shot, how many times do we tip it? Not get it, tip it. Getting it, everybody sees who gets it, but right. not everybody sees who tips it. When we, we'll beat Rutgers. We were not very good that night. Deserved to lose. We should not, we sh we could have easily lost the Rutgers. We're down five with a minute and twelve seconds to go. Quentin Grimes goes to the free throw line, misses two free throws. When the ball hit the rim, boom! We have this thing we call Australia, where one guy tries to get across to the other uh, inside the other uh, block. The other guy loops around. Boom! We tip it out. Drove gets it, pitches it to Grimes. Grimes takes a dribble, raises up, boom, knocks a three down. People is going to remember the shot. I remember the tip. That's right. But that's because those are the things, the little things we work on. And people say, you know, the big things. But when you're a development program, you've got to be more into little things than anything else. You know, those little things for us, loose balls are little things for, uh, for us, they're big things. Big things. You know, tipping that ball out, that, that's a big deal. It, call, it, it won the game for us. Not the shot. Next thing you know, instead of down five and it's their ball with a minute and 12 and they'll start ha having to play the foul game, two-point game. Yeah. Still get a stop. Don't foul. You know, just change. And, and the next thing you know, we went from down nine, four, four and a half minutes to go, we're down nine. Down five, minute 12. Find, found a way to win. And we won the game on an offensive rebound and a putback. So... Th those, those are the culture things our kids believe in. They, th almost after every big win, uh, whether it was Syracuse or Rutgers, Oregon State, Cincinnati, Memphis, Texas Tech, didn't matter who we beat during the year. It, there's nothing that makes a coach feel better, Matt, than listen to our guys talk about the importance of our culture. Uh, that they, they talk about the culture. Jerome said, that's a culture win today.
that's when you know, that's when you know that, um, um, you know, that's what coaching is about. It's, it's getting kids to believe. But when, when your assistant coaches are the gym rats, <clears throat> yeah. and those are the people that don't get enough credit. Um, my, I have such a great staff. Um, you know, we, we prop each other up. They prop me up. You know, they, they, they make this program better. And that's why I'm really careful about who I, I hire as assistant coaches. You know, I want people that are invested. I How many former players do you have with you right now? I heard, I heard I have, quite a few. Yeah, I have three. Yeah. Uh, I had four, but I have three. Now, KC that I just moved up, uh, I was coaching the Canadian senior national team. Um, and um, my video guy was, uh, well, Jay Triano was the head coach. I was the associate head coach. But our video guy was KC, it's K period, C period. Beard, this young kid, about 24, 25 years old from, um, he, was with, he was an intern with uh, Portland and then in, uh, just taking the video job with the Utah Jazz. And when I got the job, I called him. I said, KC, come with me to Houston. And that was seven years, eight years ago. Wow. I've only, I've known him for 10 years. He's, uh, he's awesome. Yeah. He's going to be great. That's why instead of interviewing guys, I don't know. Yeah. I, I just, I'm just, there's a comfort. Everybody here has been together for seven years. You know, we don't have new guys. Um, there was a guy I worked with with the Milwaukee Bucks, Anthony Goldwire, who played here at Houston, got drafted, played in the NBA for nine or 10 years. And I did just hire him to replace Mikhail. Mikhail went to Lamar. But I worked with Anthony for two years with Milwaukee. I know, I know his character. I know his work ethic. I know how, how passionate he is to help kids get better. And they're going to be stewards of your culture. They're going to help yeah. Yeah. teach it and infuse it even more. Yeah, and that's and 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 that's why you no know, the coach does the interviews. So people tend to want to give when things are good, give him the credit. But I'm telling you, Matt, this thing don't work here unless <laughs> without our staff. We we've got an awesome I've got an awesome strength coach. I've got an awesome trainer. You know, we're you know, our family, my daughter is the director of our uh, operations. Um, yeah, that's really cool. She makes us relevant 12 months a year. She's a um, self-taught design, uh, graphic design artist. She, wow. she does all our graphics. And, um, you know, we're just about every base we touch, we have somebody that's first team all conference uh, in their role on the staff. And I'm proud of them for that. Wow. You said one thing that I, th I think high school coaches, and, and it was a great reminder for myself, is we, we all love coaching the gym rats. And we always talk about, man, I wish I had more. I wish I had more. But then you did, I, you said something brilliant, I think, is we have to be those guys mm -hmm. first. Like, how can we expect them to be gym rats if we're punching out quick or if we're not opening up the gym a lot? And, man, that kind of hit me right in the heart, like, as I'm thinking about this summer. So yeah. that's huge. Coaches, uh, I, I don't know if you can see it. But right, right on that whiteboard, the, the, the highest work, we must be the gym rats. Yeah. It's got to, I, I, wrote, I wrote that up there um, two years ago. And, um, and I'm con when we have our staff meetings, I'm constantly on our, you know, I, I don't want reports, you know, recruiting is recruiting. You know, we, we're going to get good players. Yeah. That's why, you know, Jerome is a borderline NBA guy. Grimes probably is an NBA guy. We have three guys in the NBA right now that were all two or three star guys coming out of high school that we just developed them. Armani Brooks set an NBA record, made 47 threes in this first uh, 17 game. Wow. Wow. Um, Nate Hinton's coming off the bench getting uh, mop up minutes for Dallas, but he's on the team playing. Yeah. Uh, Damian Dotson got drafted by New York and got uh, signed a free agent deal with Cleveland. He started, he started for them at the end of the season. So, these are all guys that, that we developed now, Grimes and Jarreau. Next year's team has um, some kids that can develop into that uh, too. But if, if, if we don't come in here every day with our motor zone, if I've got to take my key, Matt, and stick it in your ignition and turn you on every day, uh, then that's a problem. I can't, that, then we made a mistake in evaluation. Right. You know, University of Houston, we can't make 
uh, evaluation mistakes. You know, character, toughness, are they coachable? Are they coachable by us? The way we coach, can they take that kind of coaching? Um, and that's why you don't rarely ever see a kid in the transfer portal, knock on wood, yeah, uh, yeah. From, from Houston, uh, because our, our kids, we recruit kids that know what they're getting into. And um, we try not to over-recruit, but we coach kids that want to be coached, that want to get better. Um, you know, we're not, we don't hit a hundred percent, but we hit a high enough percentage that um, we can, sus we can sustain our program every year. You said a, a lot about individual skill work. And I think that's something as, as coaches in season without even realizing it, it tends to decrease and go down. You're just focused on team, 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 but what would you say your individual skill work looks like as far as in season practice goes? Doesn't change Matt. You know, especially this year because of uh, COVID, everything was, uh, our kids had uh, uh, virtual learning, Zoom sessions, um, online classes. So they had a ton of free time, you know. Yeah. Um, 20 hours a week is really not an issue um, anymore because of the mandatory day off. So you got six, six days to get 20 hours. I don't know during the season if we even come close to 20 hours. Right. But how we get close to our 20 hours is our individual work. You know, um, uh, if this was the month of February, January, March, uh, I, I could hear balls bouncing down in the gym. You know, my, my three favorite, uh, my three favorite artists um, growing up was uh, Marvin Gaye, Al Green, um, I love Teddy Pendergraf. I love it, you know, I, I love that kind of music, but my favorite music is hearing that ball bounce. Yeah, I love you that. Know, when, you, when you're a coach and you walk in that gym and that ball's bouncing, man, that's music to your ears. And I look down there, there's no, you got, you see Kellen over at this basket with Justin Gorm and Fabian White. Here's Qantas over here with uh, Jero and Marcus Sasser, Grimes, uh, uh, Tremont Mark over here is Coach Brooks with uh, all our fives. But that, every day, I mean, that's just not – when people say every day, um, if we're not playing, it's not a day off. Our kids are in that gym working. Yeah, It's not just getting shots up. You know, you can you can get a manager to pitch balls to them, let them shoot balls for an hour. That's not a workout. Right. That's not how we work. That's not how you develop. You know, we, we work on um, – our, our, our pick and roll defensive uh, responsibilities. Uh, we work on our doubling the post responsibilities. We work on, uh, uh, you know, getting tips on miss, miss free throws. We go through everything, you know, and then we have two guns and then they come in at night and they get on those guns. But, you know, when you create a culture of, we have to outwork you to beat you. Um, uh, and you, and you've got those kind of kids, not every kid, We'll buy into that early. You just wear them down. <laughs> I you love go, that. You just wear them down. And then and then when they have a little success in the game, boom, whether it's a halftime after the game, the next day of practice, I make a big deal out of it. And that's where that confidence that you're giving them because of that preparation that they put Absolutely. in, the, the light bulb turns on for them. Yeah, they, they own it. They yeah. own the house. If you're not, you're not putting in the work, if you haven't prepared, then all you're doing is renting. Mm. And, and uh, renting, that means you got to uh, pay rent every month. When you own it, it's yours. Yeah, It's yours. It's, you, you've owned it because you worked hard enough to earn the right. You Now it's sweat equity. Yeah. And, and um, nobody's ever drowned in their own sweat, Matt. And, you know, um, working, is, um, working is sweat equity. You guys, yes, you got to get in there and work. Coaches, the one thing that every team needs is confident shooters. The last eight years at Grapevine Faith, our teams have averaged 354 made threes each season. I love getting to share with coaches how our shooters train and more importantly, how they think. If you would like to enhance your shooting culture at your school, contact me directly at jamodipodcast at gmail.com. Coach, the last thing, and this is just a, it's kind of for fun. It's a speed round. Small little questions that the first thing that pops in your head, you, you blurt it out. And it'll, about 20, 30 seconds. Sound All right. good? Sound All right, good. First one, favorite ice cream flavor? 
Orange pineapple. That's a new one. That's a new one. For high school, shot clock or no shot clock? Shot clock. Thank you. Text sticker talking. Talking. Favorite holiday? Um, Christmas. Favorite NBA player of all time? Um, Oscar Robertson. Nice. Couple more. Place you most want to travel? My lake house in North Carolina. Nice. Two more. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day? Never had a cup of coffee in my life. Never. Uh, don't drink coffee. Never wow. had one. You don't need caffeine in any way to get you going. Love that. Last one. Godfather or Star Wars? Godfather. Godfather. Coach, this was <laughs> incredible, man. Those are pretty like, neat questions there. Oh, thanks. I, I, it's kind of fun to get to, yeah. you know, I, I, I feel like I know you, but do I really know you? You know, now I know your favorite ice cream, which I've never even heard of that flavor before. <laughs> yeah, I got that from my, my my grandfather. My grandfather, a little mom and pop grocery store, and right around the corner, I was bad grocery there when I was a little boy. Wow. And there was a, uh, the drugstore had uh, ice cream, and it was um, 15 cent a cone. And, and they had orange pineapple, and it's uh, uh, difficult to find today. That's right. Sometimes you got to get on Google. I know how to get on Google and find stuff. You know? <laughs> I don't think Bluebell is is throwing out uh, uh, that. <laughs> uh, Bluebell doesn't make orange uh, pineapple. Two yeah. things I had for Google is is where can you get a thick cut fried bologna sandwich and orange pineapple ice cream. Wow. I like to. I grew up with that stuff. Don't forget yeah, where you come that's from. That's right, man. It's, it all comes back around. <laughs> Coach, you know, thank, I mean, you just gave me an hour of your time and yeah, I'm blown no away by it. Thank you for just being so uh, transparent, authentic, yeah. and you're the, you're the real deal, man. Yeah. I appreciate it, Matt. Good luck to you. Yes, and, sir. Um, get those, uh, get those kids to chew wood and spit it at people. I love it. Thanks coach. All right. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast share it with your fellow coaches and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.